This week marks the 10th anniversary of the tragic death of rocker Kurt Cobain. While authorities officially ruled Cobain committed suicide, like the untimely deaths of Marilyn Monroe and JFK, his passing has become fodder for conspiracy theorists. While well, a new book called Love and Death makes the shocking claim Cobain was murdered and examines evidence which implicates his wife, punk princess Courtney Love, Kurt Cobain's own grandfather also goes public for the first time in the book. I honestly think Courtney had something to do with it. She must have had. In the toxicology test, they said that he was so loaded with heroin that he couldn't even have picked that shotgun up. Well, the author is Ian Halperin, and Max Wallace joins us now with more. And also in our other studio, private investigator Tom Grant, whose own taped conversations with Courtney helped inspire the book. Uh, Ian, this isn't the first book on this issue. Yeah, this is the second book uh, we've Why you done. need a second one? Because there's just a plethora of new evidence, and it's owed to Kurt's fans for the facts to be revealed, especially this on the 10th anniversary of his death. There's no doubt in this book, we, it's, we just proved scientifically it's impossible that Kurt Cobain committed suicide. Um, there's just so much evidence pointing to the fact that he was murdered. There were no fingerprints found on the shotgun. Dead men don't wait their own prints. He had at least a three times lethal dose of heroin in his system. He'd be unconscious in a matter of seconds, let alone try to lift a shotgun and blow his head off. It's impossible. And the suicide note itself, um, he never mentioned suicide. The last five lines appear to have been written in the handwriting of someone else. And uh, it's a letter to his fans saying he's quitting music, not life. The most important thing, of course, that we discovered it was this these case tapes that Tom Grant gave us complete access to and in the tapes we see motive because Kurt said uh, Courtney said that uh, she was getting divorced from Kurt and there you have a motive which of course would be money and her role is definitely suspect in yeah they had a prenup and she would have been in a little trouble in terms of in terms of financial situation but Max why would they not investigate further if a forensic pathologist says this guy would have been unconscious and probably dead very quickly and there's no way he could have pull the trigger. This was a classic rush to judgment. The police and medical examiner arrived on the scene. They see this dead junkie lying there with a shotgun on his chest, what appeared to be a suicide note by his side, open and shut case of suicide. You know, it's almost understandable that they just wrote this off as a suicide. Were there any smudges on, on the shotgun? Because certainly if, if he failed, he could have smudged. But if it was clean, then you're, you're in I mean, really clean, somebody wiped it down. Well, we've talked to FBI latent fingerprint examiners, and they say that the absence of fingerprints on the shotgun doesn't necessarily prove that it was murder. But we know that at least three people handled that shotgun. Kurt, his best friend who bought the gun, and the gun shop owner. And yet there were no legible fingerprints at all on the gun, and his, his hand was still gripping one part of it, so that couldn't have uh, smudged off the, the prints. It's very suspicious. It seems as if somebody had wiped off the in, in addition, the, the last lines that Ian was referring to in that, in the so-called suicide note, uh, whether it's in somebody else's handwriting, I understand Dateline, Dateline looked at this, and their experts are saying, number one, it's not, and three of them saying, we couldn't tell. So Inconclusive. Are, yeah. Are you uh, sure that... that well, no, that, that's, the, that's the whole point. Yeah. We're not saying, well, all this evidence proves that, so put somebody in prison. We're saying it is inconclusive so why did the police immediately label this a textbook case of suicide without further examining these inconsistencies we're asking that the verdict be changed from suicide to undetermined that's the first step then you know we're journalists we're not private detectives we're not medical experts well, let me jump over before we sort of wrap that point and get to Tom Grant who is a private investigator and and Tom I must admit uh, you you were working with these people you were working at, with Courtney one at one time and now you believe that somehow she may have been involved well yes I was hired on April 3rd and uh, to find Kurt Cobain so I was <clears throat> excuse me I was hired before he was actually found dead before he actually had died and uh, from the very beginning there were a number of inconsistencies talk of divorce talk about uh, money about the fact that he was turning down Lollapalooza I was dealing with a woman who seemed more concerned with her career and with her financial interests than the fact that her husband was missing and she was claiming that he was suicidal and that everybody knew he was going to kill himself. However, a couple of days later, when I flew to Seattle, Courtney Love stayed in Los Angeles to take care of business. Uh, I don't know if my wife uh, was, if I thought she was suicidal and she was in another city, I'd certainly be on the first plane I could get out 
to go and try to find her and yeah. help her. Well, here's something really interesting where you spoke to uh, a, an attorney that worked with Courtney about suicide. Well, no. let's play this. You don't think Kurt wrote it? You no, think no I, think, I think Kurt wrote each of those words at different times in different places. I think someone went through his notebooks, found passages that could plausibly be cobbled together into a suicide and trace them. You think they were traced? Mm, yeah. yeah. Or forged or something like that. Well, are you, are have, you taping this call? I tape all my calls. Oh. Tom. Do you want me to turn it off? Yeah, I mean, I just... She, all of a sudden, very uncomfortable, but she, this, this attorney, was she an entertainment attorney that worked with both of them? Whose counsel was she? Yes, yeah, she, she did work for both Kurt and Courtney, and I met with her just a few days after Kurt's body was found. Her office was pretty close to my office in Beverly Hills, and I uh, had kind of felt her out over the telephone a little bit because I was feeling uncomfortable about some things. And when I walked in the door um, to her office when we had our first meeting, she kind of put her head down and, and shook it back and forth. And then she finally looked up at me and she said, Tom, he wasn't suicidal. Kurt wasn't suicidal. And then she went on to, <clears throat> excuse me, she went on to tell me about um, the fact that just a few weeks earlier, Kurt had called and told her to take Courtney's name out of the will that they were drawing up. She also told me that Courtney had called her about the same time and asked her to find the meanest, most vicious divorce attorney she could find. Okay. I see what we've only got a minute left, and there's so much in this book, and we're not going to get to all of it. But, Ian, you, you talk in the book about uh, false police reports, planted evidence that you really direct at Courtney. You can't conclude who committed this crime if there was one. Well, the only, what did she plan? The, the person who really told the world that Kurt Cobain was suicidal was Courtney Love. There was this incident in Rome three, three weeks before Kurt died and both Kurt and Courtney said it was an accidental overdose. After Kurt died, Courtney convinced the world that it was a suicide attempt and that's what convinced the world that Kurt Cobain was suicidal but the truth was he was the happiest he'd ever been in his and life. Did she plant evidence? Did she falsify police she, reports? She filed two false police reports the weeks before his death in which he, uh, she, she said that Kurt had locked himself in a room and threatened to commit suicide, had a gun. Police arrived, they spoke to Kurt, he said he was hiding from Courtney, and then Courtney admitted that he had never threatened suicide and he didn't have a gun. Then she filed a false uh, missing persons report under Kurt's mother's name. Hmm. Saying and she that, admits that, it. We've heard the tapes, the case did. tapes which are clearly outlined in the book. They really get into this. She, Courtney Love never denied it. There's okay, a lot what, of other very suspicious yeah, evidence on these tapes. One final question. Courtney's own father, Hank Harrison, uh, called her a psychopath with sociopathic personality? Is that, well, I is find that it, a direct I, quote? Yeah, I find it a bit, you know, deplorable that any father would accuse their own daughter of murder publicly, so you have to wonder what his motive is. Mm -hmm. However, uh, he is her father, so you have to, uh, you have to give him, you know, take him a bit seriously. Well, the book has just, I mean, we have just had the press conference this afternoon, right? Yes. The book has just hit the stands. Fascinating, fascinating. Love and death. Max Wallace, Ian Halperin, thank you both. Thank very you, good Kathy, luck for book. having us. Pleasure. All right, and Tom Gray <laughs> Stay safe. All right, for more on the Kurt Cobain investigation, be sure to log on to CourtTV's TheSmokingGun.com. Now, when we come back, things get...